the editorial director of Baker Books. super well connected, people will come if they want to come, and that would be just fine with us. Uh, and then, somebody had the idea of, uh, you know, we should get somebody who has been in the industry a little while, and uh, might know a bit more than us involved, and do an interview. So, I contacted uh, Chad a little while ago, and he uh, gracefully accepted our invitation to be here. Uh, Chad, why don't you tell us a little about what you do? So I'm the editorial director of, of, of Baker Books, which is a division of Baker Publishing Group. Baker Publishing Group has six divisions, five or six, depending on how you count. And um, the Baker Books division is a um, nonfiction division that focuses on serving the church. So a lot of Christian living books and a smaller proportion of books for pastors. Um, my role is to acquire books. I spend about 75% of my time doing that and then 25% um, doing strategic leadership stuff as, as director. Uh, Andrew, would you mind bringing those? I realized we had everyone fill out nice questions and then we left them down there, so then you would know that we weren't really asking the questions you want to know. Uh, all right, let's start out with, um, do you remember a book proposal or book that amazed you and what made it stand out? Um, well, the, the one that comes to mind is um, a book proposal we received from a Chinese dissident named Bob Fu. Um, and it stood out to me because of the story. He's, he's been tortured, um, imprisoned for his faith, and eventually had to flee um, China, now lives uh, here in the States, and does human rights work um, for uh, folks in China. So it stood out to me because of, uh, because of the story. Um, most proposals we receive um, are come in pretty good shape in terms of uh, they have the elements that we're looking for. They're pretty they're pretty fulsome in each of the in each of those elements. Um, um, so it comes down to the content, you know, not the how so much as the what. And um, so that's that's the one that comes to mind. Uh, one of the one of the questions that was submitted here is a great question. How big a role does the number of Twitter followers, blog readers, etc., play once an agent submits a manuscript? So that's a that's a question about platform, and you, you hear this term a lot. Um, what I'll say is the number one reason we turn books down at Baker Books is lack of platform. Now there are ways you can get past kind of the platform bugaboo, namely. Um, uh, a great concept with great writing. If you have both of those, platform becomes less important. But it's still, um, for us anyway, it's still the number one reason we turn books down. And I define platform as your ability to bring exposure to your book once it's published. So your ability to promote your book, essentially. Um, and obviously, blog readers, um, Twitter followers, um, Facebook fans, etc., are all um, part of that. Um, so, so we're looking for three things: concept writing and platform. And um, platform is is at least a third of, of that equation. So that's how important it is. Now, what are five things you would say a person should do who is submitting their book for the first time? Five things. Count them off. Yes. <laughs> One. <laughs> what, what you today? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I start with things like, um, you know, uh, does your spouse support you uh, in the endeavor? Uh, I mean, in other words, life systems, life structure, all of that I think is, is paramount to being successful as a writer. So, um, you know, do you have a rhythm? Do you have a specific time of the week that you're writing? Assuming that most of you are writing part time, um, 
Th those things, I think, are, are crucial. And then, so maybe that's one. one. Um, the second, I, I would think, is are you part of a, a supportive community? I, I was just, Josh was just telling me that the story uh, of Jot is the story of a writer's group that, that then decided to do this conference. So um, awesome things can happen when you're part of a supportive community. I'm part of a, I'll just share this really quickly. I'm part of a, a what I call a creative circle, and we ask three questions when we get together. Um, what's inspiring you? We go around the circle, we give each of, each of us 15 minutes. It's a social gathering, you know, we have drinks and food and stuff, but, uh, but we ask, what's inspiring you? What are you working on? And what, what would you like prompting on? And we have awesome, life-giving conversations of just just answering those three questions. So a writer's group, a creative, a group of, about creativity, I think is crucial um, to, to it. Um, and, and then I would say focus in on your book proposal. Um, workshop it like crazy with your friends and, and people you trust. Um, the platform piece is also something to work on continually. It's a long, uh, it's a long slog. It takes, it takes doing it day in and day out. Um, and then finally, I'm going to call that three and four. That was great. Uh, and then, and then the fifth one, I would say, um, to uh, continually go back to the why. Why are you, why are you doing this? Because it's it's not uh, it's not easy. And if you can have some sense of you know mission about it, uh, that can keep you motivated when the when the going gets tough. Now, just to piggyback on, on what Chad said, Chad has a blog at uh, chadrallen.com, is that right? Yay. <laughs> uh, Chad's blog, uh, I, I came across it, you didn't start that long ago, did you? About six months ago. Six months ago. Um, it is an excellent blog, and it is an excellent blog for writers who are interested in getting published and want a publisher's uh, inside scoop. Um, anyway, I mentioned that because uh, you mentioned the last thing is the why, returning to the why. Uh, Chad did an interview uh, with Rich Baker, the son of the founder of Baker Bookhouse, and that interview turned into a great uh, post about why we do what we do. Um, and I, I think you've probably gotten some great comments on there. Uh, I've, I've read it, it, it it's a fantastic post. Um, but definitely search that out, and it will help you think through why you are pursuing what you're pursuing. Uh, all right, another question that was submitted. Uh, what do you expect to be already fixed in a book before you check it? Good question. So, like, I'm assuming, like, when you get the manuscript. When you get the manuscript, what yeah. state do you want it to be in? Well, it, I mean, the way I like to work with authors is to receive the first few chapters um, as as they're completed, so that I can speak into the into the writing process early, um, so that we actually avoid having to do a lot of heavy lifting at the end. Um, but yeah, we're expecting decent writing. We're <coughs> expecting that it won't show up with a bunch of spelling errors and grammatical errors, that kind of thing. We're also expecting the the book that was proposed is the book that we're receiving. Um, and so if, if, it's, if it goes sideways, then you know, we probably should have had a conversation about that before you submitted the manuscript. Um, so those, those are some ideas. How far into that process uh, does it take you to realize that a book is not right for your publisher? Um, it depends. Sometimes you can tell um, in the cover letter uh, you don't even have to really get to the book proposal. You can just tell, and that's that's really more about fit than anything else. Like I got one just uh, the other day, and and the phrase "love lies" was in in the title, and it was about don't believe the love lies. Well, that's not a Baker that's not a Baker book. So, and, and I did take the trouble of reading the cover letter, but I could tell right away that wasn't for us. Um, our process is we have an act with, we have the you know individual editors review things, and and individual editors do have um, the the you know the, the okay to, to say no as as soon as they receive something, and then we have an acquisitions meeting and then a pub board meeting. So those are the three 
kind of the three hurdles you have to jump on the way to publication. Can you can you tell us a little bit about a pub board meeting? What how many how many books go into a pub board meeting and how many come out of a pub board meeting alive? Well, that varies. Uh, like we have a pub board this coming Wednesday, and I think there are the six or seven um, books in that agenda. That's a pretty heavy agenda. Um, I don't know the exact numbers about the percentage of books that we accept versus decline. Um, but the way a pub board works is there, are, in our case, there are 13 people in the room, including representatives from editorial, uh, publicity, marketing, and sales. And we, we have the material for at least a week. And so we show up having read it, and we have a conversation. And the, the, first, the first thing we're trying to decide is, is this a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Are we going to publish this or not? Are we going to go back to the author for something else? And then once we've decided that, um, what we try to get to is a sales projection. How many do we expect to sell in the first 12 months? And the, uh, a number of us might have input into this, but the sales VP is, is the guy who actually signs his name to the number. Um, and, uh, and then a whole bunch of other a whole bunch of other financials stem from that sales projection, including marketing budget, from which comes the publicity budget, uh, and of course the, the very important advance against royalty stems from that, um, and so forth. So that's a little glimpse into a pub board. One of the, one of the questions that um, I well a few of us in the writers group have been asking uh, is about agents. Uh, can you can you tell us a little bit about um, working with agents versus working with the authors themselves, whether they're signed or not, how many, uh, what percentage, how that breakdown is, and then which you prefer. So this is really good timing, because right now we're doing an analysis of how much we were working with agents five years ago versus now. Five years ago, about 30% of the books we acquired were represented by literary agents. Um, in fiscal 12, which ended April of last year, um, we it was like 65 to 70 percent, and this fiscal year to date, it's closer to 80 to 85 percent. So it's 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 increasing rapidly. Um, uh, you know, there are simply more agents now than there were five years ago. So they're they're a much bigger uh, a much bigger part of of what we do that way. Which one do I prefer? I, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm working with authors, whether they're represented or not. Um, it doesn't matter a whole lot, a whole lot to me. Um, I do think agents um, can be helpful. Um, uh, we have agents that have their own connections to um, promotional resources, for example. That can be useful. Um, so I learned a long time ago not to, not to, uh, to you know, disparage or, or denigrate or whatever the word is I'm looking. Or um, cast aspersions uh, on on agents. They, they they play a vital they play a vital role. Great. This next question was submitted uh, online on our Facebook uh, page. Uh, where do you stand on the second comma in a list of three things? <laughs> I'm curious too. <laughs> well, I, we go by the Chicago Manual of Style, and it calls for using the serial comma. So, which leads to the second question, also submitted online, when can we, as a society, get rid of Chicago style? <laughs> <laughs> Any feelings on that? <laughs> what, what books should be on every writer's bookshelf, in your opinion? Well, I'll tell you the ones, the, the writing, so there's this whole genre of writing books, as you know, and I'll tell you my favorites. Um, but before I say that, what, what, what I think is even more important is that you're reading the stuff the, in the genre in which you want to write. Um, so if you want to write memoir, you should be reading a lot of memoir. Um, but my favorite writing books are uh, probably my, one of my very favorites is Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art. Um, uh, uh, now I'm going to draw blanks, right? Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird, of course. Um, Annie Dillard's um, The Writing Life. Uh, Natalie Gilbert's Writing Down the Bones. Um, uh, Stephen King's on writing. Um, 
Oh, Solstein, this is one that doesn't get mentioned a lot, but I think it's hugely helpful. Solstein, Sol was a, a, a hotshot New York editor. I don't know if he's still working or not, but anyway, Stein on Writing is the title of that book. Those are the ones that are. I think we have uh, Stein on Writing, it was on the uh, shelf when you first came in next to the, the table. So check that one out on your way out, and uh, I'm sure Baker can order any. It's great because it has lots of examples, lots of concrete examples of things to do. Uh, now, without using any names, have you ever dealt with a troublesome author, and what was the trouble, and how can authors avoid being troublesome? That's a three-part. No. Uh, uh, so the way I think about this is, there's a sense in which a, a publishing contract is just that, it's an agreement to publish a book. But there's also a sense in which a publishing contract is a business partnership. So that when you sign a contract, you are becoming a business partner. There's a sense in which every book is its own little company. A publisher invests capital into the company, and then and you authors are in some ways managers of that company. I know that's, that's, that alienates your artistic sensibilities, but it's true. Um, and so, so um, you'd be surprised how many good business partners there are uh, when it comes to publishing. How can you be a good business partner? This, this could be a blog post. Um, <laughs> how, how you can be a good business partner is, uh, first of all, deliver a manuscript. Um, there are a number of authors every year who don't submit the manuscript, and so we have to go after them for the advance money. Uh, or um, when the book releases, make sure that you haven't scheduled a vacation, a three-month vacation in Hawaii or something. It's, it's important that you're there to, to support it and promote it once it releases. Um, so, I mean, pretty common sense, you know, um, stuff. Be, be a decent human being and, and you know, we'll, we'll usually be, be pretty happy. But, I mean, I say that um, because it surprises me um, how often um, those simple things um, don't, don't end up happening. Now, since we're talking about the business of books, uh, how many books need to sell before the publisher and the author make a profit? And that depends on how much we've invested in it. Um, but the math is pretty simple, and I'll, I'll just give this to you. Um, so you have the price of a book, let's say, let's say it's $20. And we sell it typically at a 50% discount, so, so we sell it for $10. Um, uh, and then you can multiply that by the royalty, which in many cases is 14%, sometimes 16%, sometimes as much as 20%. Um, and you multiply that by, I'm missing one factor, what is it? Oh, the, the, the sales projection. Um, so if, when you multiply those four things together, you can get what we're expecting to receive in royalties. So we base the first year of advance money on that equation. Sometimes it's a little less, sometimes it's exactly that, and sometimes it's more. Um, but you can, when, you, when you're offered an advance, you can use that math backwards to get at the sales projection of your book, and that's the, that's the number that the publisher is, is hoping to sell in the first 12 months. And if you hit that number, then you've done all right. Most publishers won't just tell you what, what the sales projection is, but it's pretty easy to, if you have that equation, price times discount times royalty rate times uh, number of books sold, you can kind of extrapolate what they're expecting, what they're expecting to sell in a 12, and usually it's a 12 month uh, period for large traditional publishers. Now I'm sure um, publishers are looking at the trends in order to know uh, how to buy, what's buy, what's going to sell. Do you have any insight on what trends are happening in your market right now? So that we can all write that book. <laughs> yeah, somebody, somebody was talking about Amish vampires. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about them. Yeah, the Transylvania Dutch is what I heard. <laughs> Which leads me to all kinds of cover ideas, like blood trickling from a English buggy. Covers without any actual words. Just, just a picture book. I, <laughs> uh, I'm a nonfiction guy. Um, 
like I said, and um, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, you know, good story and content and good material is always what we're looking for. Right now, it seems like um, sports biographies are, are kind of, you know, Tyndale has has really brought those to the fore, and so we're we're looking at more and more of those. Um, you know, Eric Metaxas is Bonhoeffer has brought biographies profile up. Um, so we're looking at more and more biography. Um, um, and, a, and a strong narrative is always, is, is always something we're interested in. So memoir, I think, is, is, a, is a kind of an evergreen um, genre that kind of, it kind of goes in cycles. Sometimes it's, 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 it's hotter than other times. But um, so I don't know, those are the ones that come to mind. I'll be talking to you about uh, my memoir as a translated Dutch. Person later. <laughs> um, and for our last question, uh, do you have any advice for the part-time writer uh, on how to balance uh, work, marriage, kids, and writing? You mentioned that the first uh, thing you would say to a person who is about to submit uh, a book is that they, their family needs to be behind it. Do you have any advice on how to uh, rally the troops and make life work while you're writing? Yeah, I, I think if this is important to you, it is really important to be intentional about the rhythm that you're gonna that you're gonna write within. Um, and in my own in my own blogging life, for example, I get up early uh, twice twice a week. And I know this is this is this isn't this doesn't make me a hero or anything, but it's it's what I do. I get up at four or five o'clock in the morning. On right now, it's it's uh, Tuesdays. And Wednesdays because I have to take the kids to school on Mondays and Thursdays. And on the on the off chance I get a Friday morning to do something extra. But this is my life, right? I have kids, I have a wife, I have a I have a home. And so I have to work it in somehow. And what that means for me is setting the alarm, hopefully getting to bed early the night before, waking up early, uh, finding a diner or a coffee shop that's open that early and, and working. Um, and as long as I'm ready to take the kids to school on Mondays and Thursdays, my wife and I are, are copacetic, and she's very happy to, to, uh, to be supportive. I mean, I, I just think you work it out. But the important thing is to have the conversations that, that need to happen um, for you to do that in a sustainable way, um, in a way that allows you to get some sleep and be healthy and all that. Um, so. Um, and then the other piece I can't I can't stress it enough is be, if, if you don't do anything else, please do this: get into a writing community or a creative community of some kind where you can support each other, share the joys, share the disappointments with one another. Because that will that is one of the most sustainable things you can do. Even if you're just meeting an hour once a month, um, that can be hugely hugely helpful. Well, thank you, Chad. Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you all for coming to John. This was our final presentation, but you may have noticed the uh, the time on the uh, flyer is so that it lasts until 11. What time is it now? 9.30. About 9.30. 9.30. We, we did this intentionally because as uh, a writing community, uh, the weaklings, uh, we, we come by our writing time when we can, and so we wanted to be able to offer to you uh, writing time as well. Now, you have until 11 o'clock, the store closes at 11, uh, to get some writing done tonight. Uh, you also have time to seek us out while the presenters will be staying and you can speak to us one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we would encourage you to speak with each other, uh, maybe get some details and form a writing community for yourselves. Um, but really, we want this to be a time for you to let what you've learned tonight sink in and uh, to put it into some use. Uh, we'll be submitting a survey to you by the emails if you, uh, if you give us that information later to ask how it went. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. But from now until 11, the time is yours.